Welcome to the Crime Redefined podcast produced by Zero Cliff Media. Coming to you from the U.S. Bank Tower, high above downtown Los Angeles. In our podcast, we drill deep into forensics and criminal investigation from the viewpoint of the defense, as well as explore the intersection of the media and the justice system. Thank you for listening to Crime Redefined. I'm co-host Mayhul Angeria. We now present the conclusion of our very special interview with Jane Doratic. And afterwards, Deanna and I will share our thoughts. Enjoy. Did you get some of kind of a, like a, probably the wrong word, but like a little bit of a rock star status in there of being able, you know, you've helped out, you know, 40 plus people. Did you, you were kind of like a, a legend inside there. Hey, go see Jane, go see Jane. Yeah, that did happen somewhat there. You know, people would say, and, and unfortunately they would think it translated into anything else. <laughs> and I mean, this was just one little thing that I found and was able to be effective with. But it made it difficult because women would come in and say, please, can you can you write a writ for me? Can you do this? Can you do that? And, you know, I I, I was I would help anyone as best I could. But, I, you know, I wasn't legally trained and so forth. And so it was tough. It, it, I saw so many women that could benefit from good legal help. Um, so many women that were over sentenced and, you know, I, I've said often, where do we as a society decide we have some responsibility for what's been created here, particularly victims of domestic violence and, and uh, you know, other kinds of trauma. When you take a woman that's grown up in a dysfunctional alcoholic family and then, you know, at age 13 or 14, she's out on the streets with a pimp or something. Where do we start saying, wait a minute, society has to take some responsibility for that? Because, you know, why are we not helping this family to be more supportive and functional? Um, you know, and then and these are so many women that that I would meet down the road and they were, you know, um, convicted of of killing their abusive partner and you know here they are in prison at age 19 sometimes and, and you were in two different prisons is that correct right in 2006 i moved down to um ciw could, could you compare and contrast the the conditions in each for us yeah i i would readily say that ciw was a much kinder more collaborative prison um, and there were it was a much older prison. In fact, it was CIW was the the first real women's prison in California. There was a small section as part of another, but it, it was the first standalone women's prison. And I think because it was a little farther away from the um, sort of the, the CCPOA, the guards union base in Sacramento, um, the guards were much kinder. Uh, and so it, it was also had two man cells instead of eight men cells. I mean, when you think at, at, up at Chowchilla, 246 square feet, that's how big the cell is. Eight women oh, in a 246 brutal. square oh, foot man. cell. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the age, socioeconomic uh, differences, uh, you know, one of the first things I did when I was in prison, everybody smoked in prison. And that was before um, smoking even on prison grounds was prohibited. Women were were allowed to go out 10 minutes every hour to the outside. And that's where they would smoke. But most women just smoked in their cells and hoped they didn't get caught. It was a rule that you weren't supposed to smoke in the cell. So here I am. Uh, put in a cell with seven other, other women, six of whom smoked. And I remember going to the very first, um, I forget what they call it, it's sort of your case review where the lieutenants and captains review, here's your conviction, here's what you're going to, the job you're going to do in prison, here's, you know, here's your case factors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I remember speaking up at that uh that meeting and it was considered considered inappropriate to speak up. Um, you were to be talked 
at or talked over, but you should be a compliant, quiet inmate and not speak up. But I did speak up and I said, you know, um, 50,000 people die every year of secondhand smoke and I don't want to be one of them until I can get myself out of here. And so I'm going to ask you to please put me in a cell. And by then, I mean, it was only a month into my prison stay, but but by then I had sort of learned a little bit about how prison works. So I made the effort to find seven other, other women in the housing unit where all the cells were who were non-smokers and approached each of them and said, how about if we room together? That way we don't have to breathe secondhand smoke. So I gave the, the, uh, the members of that meeting a list of, can you house all of us together in one room? And, and in fact, here's another cell that has only one person in it right now. Just move that one out, move all eight of us into this one cell. And then we don't have to deal with secondhand smoke. Well, the first thing they said to me is, you know, this is a non-smoking facility and smoking doesn't happen in the cells. And I said, I know that's what your rule is, but you know as well as I know that it does happen. And so here's a simple solution. And, and, you know, we kind of argued back and forth and the captain said, "Okay, well, on your way out, give your list to the sergeant sitting there at the desk and we'll see what we can do. Well, what really happened? So, you know, I was hopeful. Oh, this will be good. Now I can. What happened is they, the prison system moved me into a cell with the most famous (laughs) um, drug dealer in the prison system. And it was a message to me to, you know, be careful what you ask for here. Don't step out of line. You're asking for something and here's what we're going to do. They made no attempt to put me in a non-smoking cell. And so for several weeks, I had to live with. And of course, everything in the prison system is known. So immediately the room that I was put in, they knew I was a non-smoker and they knew that um, that I wanted another non-smoking room. So they made a point of smoking right in front of me and blowing it in my face and all of that. It was a way of saying, don't, don't, you know, don't try and change anything in this system. Right, right. So, you know, it was tough. Eventually, eventually at Chowchilla, I was able to um, create basically a non-smoking room. And that doesn't mean because the minute you have an empty bunk, someone transfers or paroles or something, and you have an empty bunk, the next time a bus arrives, you're likely to have that bunk filled. So what we would do when when we did create this non-smoking room is we would tell whoever came into the room, look, this is a non-smoking room. Now we're not gonna tell on you. If you absolutely have to smoke in the room, please just go outside 10 minutes every hour and smoke if you have to, Um, but don't smoke in the room. But if you absolutely have to smoke in the room, then go in the little toilet stall, hang a sheet because there's a vent fan at the top of the the toilet cubicle. Um, smoke in there because we don't want to breathe your smoke and we'll help you get out and we won't tell the cops that you're smoking or anything like that. We'll we'll <laughs> That's a creative solution. Well, it worked. It, it you know, um sometimes it was <laughs> sometimes there were resentments and so forth but um for the most part it worked and so we were able to maintain a non-smoking room uh jane what what year was it would you say that it first came on your radar that you could request post-conviction dna testing and how did you go about doing that initially um uh, you know Again, because I had worked in the law library, I tried to stay up on new laws coming around. And I had seen the new law in, in, I think it was in 2014 or 15 or something that you could, basically what the law says is if you make a a good case to say this testing may help me, um, the judge really shouldn't deny it. So I wrote my own motion for DNA testing. and really was surprised that I that I won it. I mean, it, it, I wrote it very simply and just said, you know, you have fingernail scrapings, you have one of the murder weapons, neither of which have ever been tested for DNA. 
test these things. And, you know, it, it can help me prove my innocence. So what happened is I, I won that motion. And exactly at the same time is when Loyola Law School Project for the Innocent jumped in on my case. And to be honest, I don't exactly remember when I had written to them asking for help sometime before that, but I get a letter from them saying, we're interested in your case and where are you at right now? And, you know, are you represented by an attorney and so forth? You know, having won the right for DNA testing, the first thing that happened is the um, the DAs, I, I guess I should back up. I had asked to have those two things, the fingernail scrapings and the rope tested. And I also by then was wise enough to say, don't use up all, all of the material that's available for testing. Only use 50% of it in case we have to test again down the road. Because I knew there were some sometimes bad things happen. So I asked that and I asked to not use the San Diego Crime Lab testing. Um, well, they the judge denied uh, using another crime lab. We had to use the San Diego Crime Lab. And the um, the DAs didn't respect my wish for only using 50% of the material. Um, but what the DAs initially said is, well, you have to name what type of DNA testing you want. And I said, I don't know. I'm not a DNA right. expert. I, I don't even know what, you know, you tell me what's scientifically reliable and I'll go along with it. Just give me a name. <laughs> well, they wouldn't, you know, and that's when Loyola jumped in and got the testing done. And, you know, none of my DNA anywhere. So, you know, I began to become a little bit hopeful that uh, hopeful and horrified at the same time, because, uh, you know, I'm thinking, OK, my DNA isn't there now. Doesn't that get me somewhere? Doesn't that can't you <laughs> can't you see that you have the wrong person? Uh, anyway. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, you know, you're, you're looking forward to these results, you get the testing and at least the way it's portrayed by the DA's office is that, ah, there's nothing really meaningful, you know, here in the results. So you were starting to talk about this, but then, so what's going through your mind about how you didn't get this wonderful, you know, result, I guess, after the DNA testing? Um, you know, I just, by then I was so sort of suspicious of, <laughs> of anything that, that the DAs did or said, or, um, and I just didn't know enough about it. I can't, you know, I've said over and over how grateful I, I was to have um, an innocence project look like Loyola take over and be able to challenge all of those things in a, a much more um, effective way than I was ever able to. You know, your case really took on a new life. Um, it seems when LPI became involved, how hard was it to have them look at your case? Um, what do you mean? How hard was like, it to like, have them did look? You, you know, have to con I mean, write them letter after letter or what was the process like for, for our listeners? Well, no, I mean, I got, as I was fighting to get the DNA testing done, um, I got a letter back from them saying, we're interested in your case. And and I'm thinking, gosh, this is fantastic. When did I write to them now? I don't really remember, <laughs> but this is fantastic. Someone is going to um, maybe be able to help me. And then I don't know exactly how long after that, but um, I also remember my sister, Bonnie. Um, she had met with, with um, Paula and Adam and I'm not sure who else because she had a lot of, of information on my case and she had talked with them and I remember I'm in prison and talking with her over the phone her saying I really like these people they're so genuine they're real people you know and I'm feeling so excited about that and then when when Paula and Adam came to meet with me in the prison on a legal visit, I had the same feeling. These are fantastic people and they genuinely are invested in finding the truth, which was, you know, by then I was so suspicious about who, whoever even cares about the truth anymore. 
So Jane, you know, 19 years after your conviction, you're finally released from prison due to coronavirus. And could you shed some light on what were the conditions like in the prison you were at at the time? Um, were there a lot of people sick? Were they taking appropriate precautions? How scary was that time period for you? It was really scary. Um, you know, we were hearing on the television about this new COVID virus and how many people were dying of it and how it was, you know, so very contagious and so forth. And masks were recommended. And we, in the housing unit that I was in, we started making our own masks because no masks were provided. And I remember one woman coming back and telling me, the cop told me, I have to take the mask off because I might be, it, it, you're not allowed to wear a mask in the prison system. It might be considered escape paraphernalia. And then you could get a serious write up. And, and what would you make the masks out of? Um, a lot of women have um, material. You, If you're part of the hobby craft system, you can have some material if you want to make something. So um, we just shared within our unit and we started by making masks. Myself and several other women inside just started making masks out of a little bit of material and rubber bands and so forth. And we handed them out to the elderly first and, you know, anyone else until we got everybody in the unit a mask. And then eventually the prison system um, handed out masks to everybody. But at the time, you know, there were so many things that were that were wrong with the prison system. Finally, the prison system makes the decision they're going to hand out masks and they're going to make masks and they're going to have the sewing factory, which was right inside our prison. They sew all of the inmate clothing and so forth. So they're going to have the sewing factory make these masks and they're going to bring over material from the men's prison, CIM, right across the, why they had more material, I don't know, or more. Anyway. So the delivery of the material to make all of the masks is brought over and it's brought over by a non-masked person handling it without gloves. And we already know at CIM, the men's prison, the numbers were astronomical in terms of um, positive cases. So I'm thinking, wait a minute, you're, you're bringing this stuff over and you're breathing on it. You're touching it with your bare hands and we're trying to be safe here. Anyway, it, it, there were so many things that were just horrifying to me, but we all we all did get masks. And then when I was released, I mean, I knew Paula was going to ask for my release. Um, and she had been very open saying it's not likely that it's going to happen. But, you know, the good news is the original judge, Judge Elias, that had been hearing all of the information in the original writ that, that um, Loyola put forward for me. I, I believe that he believed in my innocence. I believe that he could see all of the things that were coming out now. And so he did release me. And at the time of my release, I think there were maybe 10 cases or something at CIW. Within a week, literally, there was 200 cases and oh wow it just dodged a bullet there absolutely absolutely when you were released did you feel like you were never going back or did it just seem like it was temporary no i felt like i was never going back i felt like i'm absolutely on my way i mean you know by then all of the things that loyola had uncovered and all of the faith and confidence i had in them i just knew we were going to win um so I felt like I'm never going back. The the, um, the challenge of reentry is a major one. I mean, so many things happened to me. My identity was stolen while I was in prison, oh, and I had a lot of trouble getting social security card. I had no, you know, no driver's license, no anything, and so to be able to gain an identity was a major task. It was a major task just to get. Uh, something like simple Medicare. I mean, I was 73 when I was released from prison and to be able to be covered by Medicare, um, they said, oh, well, you didn't register when you were age 65. 
And I said, I tried. I sent you letters. I, I sent you, I, I tried to get the prison system to register for me. But of course, I'm a prisoner. And all I can use is a, you know, a phone that will only deliver collect phone calls. So it's not as if I could call Medicare myself. Fortunately, I had kept some track of communication with the prison law office, with other organizations about my attempts to um, register for Medicare, because I knew that they had a standard that if you don't register at age 65, they will impose a cumulative 10% penalty um, for each year that you don't register when you're supposed to. And so, you know, he, here all of this blows up in my face and Medicare is telling me, you never registered. So A, you're going to have to wait. And B, you're now, I don't know, eight years past the time when you should have registered. So that's all going to come out of your social security retirement benefits. And I'm thinking, no, this is not right. You can't do it. And that, that took months of fighting. And eventually I was able to get it and have them understand that I had made an attempt to register. It just compounds everything. I you're, you're detailing a lot of stuff. A lot of people just don't think about that. You're, yeah. you're trying to control while you're incarcerated and then you've got to clean up you know, when you get out and you live, know, the, the, it's crazy. Like the, the, you just mentioned having your identity stolen while you're imprisoned. I mean, I mean, it's like a, you're being penalized again and again and again. And, you know, apparently that's a relatively common thing to the extent that now apparently CDCR has put some mechanism into place to search people's identity. Because when you, when you think of it, if, some, if someone decides they are going to be an identity thief, What's a better target yeah. than an elderly person in prison? Because yeah. who in prison is going to check their social security records? <laughs> what, what were you feeling when you first got the newest post-conviction DNA results? And were you expecting it would identify a particular person as the killer? I was hoping, yes. I was hoping we would find something that we could put in the CODIS database. And maybe with a little luck, we'd be able to identify. And so, yeah, I was... I mean, I knew the DNA testing was going to come back negative. I just didn't know how far, what more we might find out and how much it would be able to help me. All right, Jane, one of the team members that joined LPI was Mike Cavaluzzi. Uh, and he was, you know, kind of the voice in the courtroom during your new preliminary hearing, some of the other hearings. What was your opinion of the job that that Mike did and how, how good was it to have him on board? It was great to have him on board. And what was really, really great is to watch the collaboration between Mike and the whole Loyola team. Um, you know, the, the, the whole Loyola team would take a portion of the case, whether it's tire track evidence or DNA testing, and each one of the attorneys would would comb through everything that we had and basically be able to provide to Mike Cavalusi, here's here's the level of questioning that you should have for their next expert witness. And so it was um it was great, great collaboration between the Loyola attorneys and Mike Cavalusi. Um, you know, he's a very personable person anyway. And he has incredible instincts about how the judge is reading things. Um, He just has great courtroom skills. But um, it, it was he was very well prepared because of Loyola. You know, Jane, I know that you're continuing and expanding the advocacy work you've been doing all along. Talk to us about what you've been up to since the dismissal of your case. And I understand that you're working on something special with Paula. If you could please share that. Yeah, I'm, um, I've been working with the California Coalition of Women Prisoners for about 15 years from within the prison system before I was released. Um, and I would, um, you know, advocate for women to be their own best advocate in terms of staying up to speed on new laws that were coming around. Um, You know, things have changed radically within the criminal justice system uh, just in the last 10 years. And it's important for women to be able to have hope and know that there are new laws. So I worked with CCWP, California Coalition of Women Prisoners, while I was inside. 
And then almost immediately after I was released, they asked me to be part of what they call their coordinating committee. It's part, it's like the leadership group within their organization. Um, so I've been doing that. I've been, you know, and, and what, what CCWP does is advocate for women prisoners, specific needs of women in, in many, many ways, whether it's conditions inside, whether it's um, supporting new legislation, et cetera. Um, then I've also been a part of the DA Accountability Coalition because, again, um, this started in L.A. County when George Gascon was running for office and um, the fear was that Jackie Lacey might be reelected. And so we really are going to have to hold DAs more accountable. And, you know, when you look at the power the DA's office has in terms of bringing charges, setting bail, requesting set bail, the judges almost always go along with whatever the DAs request. And so um, how did we how did we evolve that in this by nature adversarial system between DAs and attorneys, public defenders? Um, why can't we just get together and and look toward the pursuit of truth and justice? Um, how did we arrive that the DA's um, budget is so much bigger than the public defender's budget that they have full authority to investigate anywhere and anytime they want, and yet public defenders or any innocence organization, they have to find the money to be able to do a thorough investigation. Somewhere I read that for every $60 a public defender is able to spend to defend you, the DAs have the ability to spend at least $100. So how is that a fair system? So that's what the DA Accountability Coalition is all about. I'm actually surprised that that money gap isn't yeah, larger. Yeah, you're going to say a thousand, right? It, it may well. That's an older statistic that I gave you. It might be much larger now. <laughs> um, and then you know the the most the group that I'm most passionate about is the Los Angeles Innocence Project that has just been created. Eliza and and. Paula and Paige and Hillary and Aisha, it, you know, it's first of all, it's a great group of attorneys that have formed this. And secondly, the partnership between the Davis Hertzberg Criminal Science Criminal Forensic Center is, when you think of it, so very important. Because again, this, this concept of DAs being able to hire any expert and put them on the stand and then they're an expert witness and they say whatever they want and the jury says oh well an expert said so it must be true um without ever really looking into what is the real basis for this you know when you look back at things like bite mark evidence or uh, ballistics or it's so easy for someone to say well yeah that's a match fingerprint evidence um without really uh, thoroughly investigating so to have this partnership between the uh, criminal forensics center and uh, an innocence project, I think is just fantastic. And I, I'm really, really excited to be a part of it. Yeah. And then what exactly is your role, Jane, in the, in the new project? Uh, policy advisor, just in terms of, you know, What's the best way to go forward in terms of how we help? You know, I've long said there are so many people in prison. Yeah, they're they're probably guilty of some things. They're not, you know, they're not factually innocent. But they've been over prosecuted in so many ways. And how is that fair? Uh, how can we find ways to help them also? So on a lighter note, Jane, uh, since the dismissal of your case, have you been able to get back to your love of horses at all on any level? <laughs> Absolutely, I have. And oh, that's great. I, Wonderful. That's great. Yeah. In fact, uh, this is the confidence of before I was released from prison, my daughter actually gave me a horse and said, this is going to be your horse when you get out, mom. This is this is the horse for you. And she oh, was nice. absolutely right. And I've been riding him and he's just wonderful. He's uh, way more talented uh, than I am as a writer. He 
can do very high level dressage movements. And most of the time, I don't really know how to cue him accurately. <laughs> and sometimes he'll look back at me like, lady, just get your act together here. I want to, <laughs> I want to do what you want me to do, but you better give me a clear message. And he's very sweet and he loves me. And so it just has been, you know, it's being able to ride again. And, and in particular, that first day when I came to Florida to visit my daughter and son-in-law and my daughter said, mom, Andre's going to pick you up from the airport and he's going to bring you right to the barn and I'll have the horse all ready. And <laughs> I said, oh, Claire, it's OK. You know, I, I might be jet lagged. I might we can do it the next day or whatever. And she was kind of insistent. No, no, really, you should. And so there's this funny scene. So that's exactly what I did. I came right from the airport. And sure enough, the horse anthem is his name was all ready. And it was kind of like if you envision um, a toddler first learning to walk. Here's <laughs> Claire on one side, Andre on the other. Hands out in case mom's going to fall off the horse. You know, and I, I'm I, I'm. Not young, was <laughs> and I don't want to fall off a horse. <laughs> was that the first time you'd been on a horse since all of this? Oh, yes. How, how did that feel, like just being back on a horse? What was that feeling like? That was, it, it was so much more than just riding a horse. It was, um, it was me recognizing not just the right, but the responsibility to reclaim the life that was stolen from right. me. It meant so very much to me. and. And, I, you know, I didn't even realize it at the time. I think my daughter, Claire, probably instinctively, you know, connected with some cosmic <laughs> influence there to know how important that was. She just knew. But she just knew. And it's been so wonderful for me on so, on so many ways. That's wonderful. Let me ask one other fun kind of trivial question here, Jane. When you were first released from prison, what was the first meal you wanted to have? <laughs> It's so funny that you would ask that because that's what a lot of people ask inside when you get out, what's going to ah, be right, the first right. thing you're going to eat. And it was not, you know, um, I, the, the food of it was not that important to me. Although sure, I will sure. tell you, I went, I was thinking, I went with my sister because I was first staying with my sister and I, you know, when I first was released, of course, I was quarantined because of COVID. But then I was able to go to the store with her and she was, bless her heart, saying, pick up anything you want. Put it in the basket. Come on, whatever you want. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my gosh, I haven't had sourdough bread in more than 20 years. That sounds so wonderful. And then when I brought it back and ate a piece of it, I thought, yeah, it's good. But I mean, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> I assume you're doing a lot of media these days. What does the future hold for you, Jane? Well, I just, I feel like the world has to become much more aware of what's wrong with the criminal justice system and in particular prisons. You know, I really so strongly believe that prisons really do not help anyone. And and in saying that, I'll, I'll be quick to say, I'm not saying that people don't heal in prison. Many, many people heal, and perhaps having that sort of time out um, to to self reflect is important. But six months worth of a time out, not twenty years. Um, and so, I just I feel so strongly that there are so many other things that we could do when people do go astray. So many restorative justice sorts of um, approaches that would be so much healthier and so much cheaper. You know, the, the, the prison system, $18 billion is what California's taxpayers are spending on the prison system this year. And we have a recidivism rate of, you know, more than 50%. So how, what's wrong with this system? How can we continue to do what we're doing and thinking it's a good thing and thinking somehow it promotes public safety? It doesn't. Um, and there are so many other things we could do to promote public safety. Well, Jane, thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. We really appreciate your, you know, the deep coverage of your yeah, ordeal. Your honesty and At, yeah, and I think it really helped to shed a lot of light on what we need to fix in the system. So, you know, Jane, 
pleasure talking to you and good luck with all your endeavors. Oh, thank you so much. Wow. You know, Dion, for some guests, we've got to sort of pull the story out of them and, you know, keep prompting them. But man, oh man, Jane answered all of our questions and then some. I mean, I thought that was a really wild ride sort of in and out of prison. Yeah, the details that she provided were really amazing and actually really take you inside, you know, the the various jails and prisons that uh, she went through during her incarceration. Yeah, it gives us a roadmap of of how things need to be reformed and why. Absolutely. For for me, the big two reveals, or I wouldn't say reveals, but, you know, important topics that I came away with or left impression on me is probably a better way to say it, was um, Jane's never-ending sense of hope. Um, which I thought was key. She was just seemed upbeat throughout the process as much as you can you can be in her circumstances. And, and the second one is the gamesmanship that the air quotes here, the system played on convicted inmates. And you could probably better detail this than me, but it was the example she gave of the judge sentencing and then that not being honored when they were being processed um, into prison. Crazy. That, just that no, was absolutely maddening to listen to. Oh my God. Just no continuity in the system. Is that, are people not writing this stuff down or, you know, and then you, it's, I, it's I don't amazing. think so, man. I hate to cut you off, but that's yeah. for me, for me, it's, it's, it's like airlines or theaters, it's button seats and you see it. It's the, the ROI. Uh, you, you have a, a, a robust prison population, which means union jobs and more money coming into the system. And it's the, the most vulnerable in the system that are being that are being played. And that's the only way I can I can see it. Yeah, you know, I, I what struck me is how Jane um, was very adaptable to whatever situation she was in, and she sort of rose as a leader. You know, whether it be figuring out the smoking in the cell thing, yeah. or or like you say, helping mm-hmm. other inmates, uh, and she just she seemed to be like the go to person. And um, quickly, I mean, quickly, she usually that stuff takes time, but she came yeah. in gun, you know, I just say guns hot, you know, ready to rock and roll and, and didn't back down from anybody. And sooner or later, it seemed like she was able to, you know, execute whatever she wanted to do. Yeah, it's almost like if anybody could could handle this, it was her. There was just something in her that made her strong enough to be able to adapt. And then another thing I would add is that, you know, as we very often we see in wrongful convictions, I didn't hear bitterness from Jane which no. always, always amazes me. I mean, obviously she's pissed. Well, how about Fernando? You know? Hernandez. Bermudez, right. excuse me. Yeah. He's the same way. I'm like, the guy didn't like have a care in the world. I'm like, man, you were locked up for how many years? And he just put it behind him. Exactly. And, you know, instead what she did is she she funneled whatever outrage she had into reforming the system. Yeah. And she's made it her calling to really make sure that this doesn't happen to other people. And, you know, wow, that that's, that's really noble. And, you know, she said she started stuff in prison and she's continuing it. She's, you know, she's kept her word. You know, um, I hate to put you on the spot, but just what's your take on the, on the, the kind of who done it. If she, she's exonerated, she walks, she's free. So somebody's responsible for her husband, her husband's death. Right. Right. So then there's always the question then, is there a safety issue out there or has there been for 20 years or so? Right. And, you know, it may be that we don't know. There could have been other homicides or crimes committed by the same individual or individuals, and we just don't know about it. Um, You know, certainly like Paula talked a little bit about the mechanics of what some of the other investigation is, but, you know, ultimately it's not the defense's job to solve the case you know um it's nice like i think with the dna testing had a name popped up and you would have nailed somebody that's always the best result right because you've fixed the injustice and then you've gotten somebody who's dangerous off of the street as well so we didn't have that here um but the injustice was fixed yeah, I, I i'm hoping sooner or later you know people always talk and i mean every day we're seeing you know crimes from decades ago being solved i hope it doesn't go that long but i hope that this one you know that jane will have some closure on who's responsible for her husband's death yeah you know and uh, like we all say the more these cases are discussed in the media and podcasts or whatever people start coming forward we had people coming forward you know jane talked about the people who particularly towards the end of her trial were saying listen we saw bob on you know sunday jogging 
uh, contrary yeah. to what the police's theory. And there were more people coming forward. And of course, Jane talked about some of the, or I'm sorry, uh, Paula talked about some of the um, other possible suspects. And the problem is that if, here's the whole thing about this tunnel vision is if you don't investigate all of those other options, now we've lost 20 some years, right? That's right. It's very hard to go back and investigate it. So try as they may, Loyola tried to uncover alternate suspects, but but that window may have closed. Yeah, that was um, frustrating. Those those two that came forward that saw him yeah. with a couple people and then a truck and for to not have those run down, you can see how wrongful convictions can take place because all you need is that, you know, one or two witnesses, eyewitnesses and it changes the whole dynamics of the case. Yeah, that's what you see in these wrongful convictions is they just, you know, they find vision, somebody right. who's willing to testify and it changes the whole tenor yeah. of the case. Then you throw some physical evidence on there and it's a whole different ball game. But, you know, uh, I, I'm quite sure, Dion, that our series on Jane's case is going to generate a lot of thoughts and <laughs> an comments and opinions. For sure. and, you know, I hope hope you'll all share it on social media. You know, don't be shy. And we always like any kind of interaction you want to give us. That was a real treat to be able to do a deep dive into Jane's case, Mayhole. You know, we, we really appreciate our fans and listeners and social media followers. We've got some big things planned for the future. So as always, be sure to catch all of our episodes at crimeredefined.com. Until next time, take care, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Crime Redefined podcast. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Crime Redefined. Please send us your comments and questions and join us for the next episode.